Good morning. If you have your Bibles, I'd like to invite you to turn with me back to Colossians. We took a two-week hiatus for um, Palm Sunday and Easter, so we go back to Colossians. We're still in chapter 1, and the Lord willing, we will finish today, uh, chapter 1 today. Hey! Yay! The last time we were in Colossians, we looked at one of the most powerful theological statements regarding who Jesus is. <clears throat> of uh, the fact that he uh, is the creator, he is the reconciler, he is all sorts of wonderful things. And now Paul, uh, as uh, John Knight in his commentary on Colossians, says he takes kind of a sidestep here and he talks about his ministry, Paul's ministry. And it seems that he has to prove who he is. I don't know, have you ever had to prove to somebody who you are uh, or what you do? We, we see a lot in the, in the um, epistles that Paul had to prove to the people who he was. When he wrote, he wrote things like, I am Paul and I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ, uh, and so on and so forth. A lot of times, sometimes we find it necessary that we have to prove to uh, different people who we are and what we're doing and why we're doing this. Why, what, what gives me the authority to say the things that I'm doing? What gives me the authority to tell you this? Dr. Uh, Vanderpool tells the story of uh, going on a camp meeting to Canada and he got in his car and he gets to the place where they cross into Canada and he, uh, this is way back, way back then in the 70s and he gets over into Canada and he's stopped by the Canadian police and they ask him, they says, well what are you, what are you doing? He says, I'm going to Canada. And they said, well, we know you're going to Canada because you're in Canada. But what are you going to do? And he said, well, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, do a uh, camp meeting. And they uh, said, so you're an elder in the Church of the Nazarene. And he says, yes, I'm, I'm an elder. And he says, well, do you have anything to prove to me that you are an elder in the Church of the Nazarene? Now, he didn't have his certificate. It was on his wall back in his uh, office, back in his home. And he says, no, I, I don't have a, a certificate, but I do have a copy of the district minutes that says that I am a elder. But it's in one of my suitcases. So he had to get out of the car take out all the suitcases, find the one that had the uh, um, district minutes in it. Finally he found it. Finally they got to the V's, showed the, the Canadian police, and he says, yeah, I guess you're right. You're, uh, uh, it says here that D.I. Vanderpool is a elder in the Church of the Nazarene. And then he goes, how do I know that you are D.I. Vanderpool? So then he had to fish out his fishing license and his driver's license and all sorts of licenses to show him that now I am B.I. Vanderpool. And after all of these, finally, the guy says, okay, I've seen enough. You are D.I. Vanderpool and you are an elder in the Church of the Nazarene. Have a wonderful time at camp meeting and he let them go. Now that's a comical story of having to prove Right? Who you are. And, and Paul, in this section of scripture, is having to prove who he is. That he is a minister of the gospel. And he is here to proclaim a message to the people. So let's look here 
at uh, chapter 1, and I want to begin reading at verse 24. He says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what which is lacking in Christ's affliction. Of this church I was made a minister, according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit, that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. That is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations but has now been manifested to his saints to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this majesty mystery among the Gentiles which is Christ in you the hope of glory and we proclaim him admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom that we may present every man complete in Christ. And this and for this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. Now I've divided this section up into two parts. Part one is Paul's commission, and part two is Paul's proclamation. In verses 24 through 26, we see Paul's commission. And what do we mean by commission? We, we mean that Paul is commissioned to be a, a minister of the gospel. The, the first thing I want us to note here is that Paul was commissioned by divine appointment. Now, I want to skip for just a moment to verse 25. We'll come back to verse 24, but I want to say this. That before we can understand verse 24, we must understand verse 25. And you'll see what I mean here in just a second. Let's look at verse 25. The first thing Paul says here is that he was made a minister. Now, if you have the, new, the NIV, it's going to read that I became a servant. I, I struggled with that phrasing, I, as most people in here know. I have a love-hate relationship with the NIV. There are certain things that I really like about the NIV, and, and then there's just certain things that I just kind of shake my head and go, what? And then this is one of them. Not that the word, I, I have a problem with the word servant, because the word minister in the New American Standard is the word for servant, and, and I have not a problem with that. I have a problem with the word became, because that's not what a minister does. We don't become ministers. And when I think of becoming ministers, I think of the fact, well, I'm going to become a minister. I'm going to go to school, and I'm going to learn, and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to choose this as a profession. That's not the way it works. Yes, you do go to school, and yes, you do learn, but you don't choose ministry. You don't just become a minister. Ministry chooses you. We, are, we don't become it, we're made it. God makes you a minister. Amen. Because he's the one that calls you. And so the first thing that he says in verse 25, he says, of this church, I was made a minister. I didn't choose it. It chose me. Let me tell you what I mean. All throughout this, the, the, the New Testament, Paul uh, uh, tells us that he was appointed and called by God to be a minister. Turn, if you will, to Acts chapter uh, 26 for a moment. Put your uh, uh, finger or a bookmark or a marker in Colossians. 
because we'll kind of be hopping around here, but uh, Acts chapter 26. He is giving his testimony to King Agrippa as to why he is being tortured or he is uh, being hated. And he gives his testimony of his conversion. And this is what he says in chapter 26, verse 13. He says, At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining all around me and those who were journeying with me. And when I, we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Is it hard for you to kick against the goats? What does that mean? It means that God was calling him to be a minister, but he was trying to fight it. He was trying to do his own thing and trying to go his own way, and God says, quit trying to fight the calling. Meaning that if you try to do anything else in your life, if you try to succeed in any other business venture, you're going to fail miserably until I get a hold of you. I want you to do one thing and one thing only, and that's to be a minister. So quit trying to kick against the goats. Quit trying to fight me. Verse 15, and I said, Who art thou, Lord? Who are you? And the Lord says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now verse 16, But arise and stand upon your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you, now watch this, to appoint you as a minister and a witness not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things which will appear to you. What does God say? He says, I'm appointing you to this job. And I can attest to that. I can tell you that I tried to do other things. I tried to be a school teacher. I tried to do other things. And God says, no, I don't want you to do that. I want you to do this. A minister who is a true minister of God is one who has been appointed by God. Look, if you will, at Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, verse 15 says, he says, But I have written very boldly to you on some points so as to remind you again because of the grace that was given to me from God. Where is the grace? The grace was given me from God to be a minister. God gives ministers extra, I think he gives ministers extra grace. They got a lot on their plate. We have a lot on our plate. But I thank God for the extra, <laughs> the extra grace. <laughs> to be a minister of Jesus to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest of the gospel of Christ of God, that he might, that my offering of the Gentiles might become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Now here, this does not refer to entire sanctification, but rather it refers to the setting apart for holy use. Meaning that God, watch this, that it is God who sets us apart, the Holy Spirit sets us apart for the ministry. We can't do this on our own. We have to have special power from the Holy Spirit to do our ministry. He gives us the grace and he sets us apart. 
Okay? Second Corinthians chapter 3. Turn over there. I know I'm giving you a lot of scriptures and I apologize, not really, but uh, I want you to see that this is from the Bible. I don't want you to go home and say, well, Pastor Mason came up with this out of his head. Second Corinthians chapter 3. You're welcome. I would have had a PowerPoint, but the program that I use that usually makes a PowerPoint with my manuscript didn't make a PowerPoint. So hopefully it'll work next week. Second Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 4. says this, And such confidence we have through Christ towards God. Now I want you to make note of that. Confidence through Christ. Not that we have adequate, not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant. Not the letter, but of the Spirit, for the Spirit kills, but the Spirit gives life. Let me tell you, there are many times in my life and in my ministry where I feel inadequate. I feel like I don't have enough training. I feel like I don't have enough study. I feel like I don't have enough knowledge. And this is what God tells me. I, I, he, he reminds me of this verse a lot. Because I go to places and I go, Lord, I don't even know why I'm here. I, I'm not, I don't have the education. I don't have the, the what for. And God says, he says, I make you adequate. I make you competent. We don't have competence in our own self. We have competence because God gives us the adequacy. I can do a whole sermon series on adequacy and inadequacy because we, we all feel inadequate at times. Okay? But what, I'm, what we're saying here is that, that the confidence that God gives us is from him because he made us servants. And that word servant there is also the word for, for minister. Okay? <clears throat> 1 Timothy chapter 1. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. Now again, some of these are probably um, repeating or... or but I want you to see that this is consistent in his, in, his, in his teaching. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me. Why? Because he considered me faithful putting me into service. This is Paul. Paul, uh, Paul says God does several things. Number one, he strengthens me. Number two, he considered me faithful. And number three, he put me into service. We didn't put ourselves into service. God put us into service. Then finally, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Just turn over a few, and he's talking here uh, about prayer. And he says in verse um, verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all the testimony born at the proper time. And for this I was what? Appointed, right? I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying. As a teacher of the Gentiles, in faith and truth. So what is Paul saying through all these things? Watch this. He is saying that God is the one who appointed me. 
right? And so he says in Colossians, back in Colossians, where he says, I am made a minister. He is saying that I'm not this because of my own power or my own strength. I'm here because God made me. He made me and he entrusted this ministry to me. The word stewardship is the word for, for, for entrust. Where he says in verse 25 that he says that of this church I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God. You can also translate this as according to the commissioning of God. God commissioned this. He entrusted it to me. Okay? He, God bestowed on me for your benefit. What's the purpose? So that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. Okay. Second part of this that we see here. that Paul's suffering was a direct link to the fact that he was commissioned by God or appointed by God. Remember I told you that you wouldn't understand verse 24 until you understood verse 25? Why was Paul able to suffer? Why was Paul able to, to go and not be paid or go and be without food and go and do all these things? Because he was a minister. Because God put him in that spot. Because God called him to do it. Amen. And if God called him to do it, he's going to do it. And he says in verse 24, he says, I rejoice in my sufferings. And you go, well, how in the world can a person rejoice in their sufferings? And I'll tell you how. When they understand who it is that called them, who it is that commissioned them to do this, they're going, I'm not doing this for you, I'm doing this for God. I'm doing this because God called me to this. I'm doing this because God put me to this. Paul said in one, in, in one spot, he, says, he, he said that... Uh, uh, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. I'm under compulsion. Jeremiah said that if I don't speak the words God's called me to do, it burns in my it burns in my spirit like fire. I know how that is when you don't when when, when you don't do what God puts you to do. He gives you spiritual indigestion, Amen. and poor Howie, it's not a place you want to be in. God will make it burn. He'll give you a message. And he'll give you a sermon. And it'll burn. And you're like, i got to get this message out. <laughs> Not because I want to. Because I have to. I'm, under, I'm being compelled to. So he says, verse 24, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up with that which is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Why? Because I am a minister. Because God called me to be a minister, God appointed me to be a minister, and so I'm going to go through whatever hardship he's got for me, because that's what God's called me to do. In Acts chapter 5, we read these. Now this is referring to the apostles, those who have been, like Paul, called by God as ministers. And in Acts chapter 5, after they were hauled into the Sanhedrin and they were told, you know, you can't preach about Jesus, you got to keep quiet, you know. What you're preaching is just way too offensive. What happens? Verse 5. Or not verse 5, but Acts 5. Verse 41. So they went on their way from the presence of the council. 
Now watch this. Rejoicing that they have been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. Let me ask you a question. Do you rejoice when you suffer? Do you rejoice at the opportunity to be defamed by the world? If someone mocks you from your faith, you come home and go, yes! Woohoo! Yeah! Someone mocked me today. Someone, someone hated me today. Woo, yeah! I mean, that's what they were doing. They get beaten, told, and come home. Thank you, Jesus, that we were able to be, we were able to suffer for Jesus. Well, you do that today, someone might think you're not right in the head. Right? Because we have this, we have this idea of, of, of a right relationship to God means no problems and no suffering and no trials and no tribulations. But here's the deal. That's not real. <laughs> the Bible tells us that in this world you will have many tribulations. <laughs> but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world, praise the Lord. And so that's the message we, we, we have here, that they were counted worthy of suffering disgrace for his name. Acts chapter 9, a few chapters later. This is... <coughs> <coughs> excuse me. This is um, uh, after Paul got converted. And God goes to Ananias and he says, now I want you to... I want you to um, I want you to go and lay hands on Brother Saul and I want you to help him and uh, Ananias is going like are you crazy? Oh thank you um, are you nuts man this guy he's a he's a persecutor of the of the Christians. He's, he's not a guy I want to mess with. And what does Paul, what does God say to, to, uh, to Ananias in verse, 14, in verse 15? He says, But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine. Okay? Just think about this. Your pastor, or pastors in general, in, 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 um, general, are chosen instruments of God. Amen. He says, he's a, he's a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name for the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. But then he goes on, and he doesn't end there. Yeah, this chosen instrument of mine is going to do great things. But, verse 16, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So there is a, a, a sense in which there is great work, but also great suffering. So Paul says, I rejoice in my suffering. And his rejoicing in his suffering is in light of verse 25. That's why I, I, I waited and did verse 25 first. Because if we, we don't understand his purpose, we won't understand his reaction. How, how can this man rejoice in suffering? Because this man is doing what God has called him to do. God called him to obey him and leave all the consequences to him. And that's what, God, that's what Paul's doing. And so he rejoices in his suffering. Three. 
God's purpose of the commission. What is the purpose of the commission? To present the word of God in its fullness. Look at verse 26. That is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and the generations but has now been manifested to his saints. That's, my, that's what God's called me to do. This mystery. Now I want to uh, um, back it up with, at the end of verse 25. That I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. The word that fully carry out. I want to fully carry it out. Carry out what? The mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and the generations but has now been manifested to his saints. Well, what is that? Well, that leads me to my second point, and that is proclamation. Proclamation. He's been commissioned. He's been commissioned to preach the gospel, right? The word of God. He describes what the word of God is. It is a mystery. So what is it is, is he proclaiming? Right? What, what is he proclaiming? Well, come on, pages. Don't stick together on me. What is, it, what is his proclamation? His proclamation is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Verse 27. To whom God will to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That Jesus Christ, watch this, that Jesus Christ can have a personal relationship with you, Christ in you. And it's not just for the Jews, but it's for the Gentiles as well. It's for everybody. Amen. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. That he is reconciling the whole world to himself. That we are all one, we are all, all Christians, we are all bound together by our love for God. That we're not different colors, but we are all one. W.H. Book, a preacher and author, put it like this. The Jews had their Moses, Rome had her Caesar, France had her Napoleon, England had her Gladstone, America her Washington, and the church has her Jesus. The Son of Man and the Son of God. You see, everything is different. Everybody has their own thing. Everything is separate. But watch this. He is not the Son of a man, but the Son of Man, the child of the race. And through his veins coursed the blood of all races, the gift of the Father to the whole world to make us one. It's what the Apostle Paul, excuse me, what he said in 2 Corinthians 5.19, that God was reconciling the world to himself. What does that mean? Reconciling the world to himself. That he was Fixing the problem. If you have a broken relationship with someone and you fix it, you reconcile it, you make it right. That he was reconciling the word 
to himself through in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. What is our pro, uh, proclamation? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Second, why do we proclaim this message? Why do we proclaim to you the message of Jesus? What's the purpose for me being here every Sunday? Your completeness in Christ. Look at verse 28. And we proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man. Why do we do that? Why do I admonish people? Why do I, I, I go to them and say, hey, you need to knock it off. Or hey, you need to straighten up. Why do we teach them? Why, why does the pastor do that? Not because it gives him joy. What does he say here? With all wisdom, why? That we may present every man complete in Christ. My job is to make sure that when you get to heaven, you're mature. That's my job. Now, if you don't listen, that's your problem, but my job is to help you get there. Now, you've got to help me out. I always consider it to be like a teacher. I do my part, you do your part. I can teach you, I can admonish you, but if you don't receive my admonishments and receive my teachings, you're not going to be any better for it. We don't just do this for the we don't do it for the fun of it. There's a purpose in this that we may present to you complete in Christ. Or I like the NIV. Here's where I have my love relationship. I love the NIV that you may be mature in Christ. Hebrews 6 1 says, Therefore, let us, move, let us move beyond the elemental teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity. Not laying again the foundations of repentance from acts that lead to death and faith in God. James says in verse 4 of chapter 1, Let perseverance have its perfect work so that you may be mature and complete. Not lacking anything. Now that that's the role that trials play, but God's goal for you is that you would be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Amen. What do we proclaim? We proclaim Christ in you, the hope of glory. Why do we proclaim it? so that you will be mature, complete in Christ. Number three, is this proclamation easy? No, it is not. Paul says in verse 29, the last verse of our text, it says, and for this purpose also I labor. Oh man, does he labor. Do pastors labor? Yes, they do. Striving according to his power. <laughs> Thank heavens it's not my power that I have. I ran out of steam a long time ago. Right? Pastors do that. They, they could run out of steam. If it wasn't for the fact that God gives us more steam, we'd run out of steam a long time ago. Striving according to his power which mightily works within me. And for this purpose I labor. It's not easy. The ministry is not easy. So what can you do? Well, you can listen to your pastor. You can be receptive of your pastor when he has to correct you. And thirdly, you can pray for your pastor. Pastor. 
that Paul says, what I'm about to teach you, what I've taught you in chapter 1, what I'm going to teach you in the rest of these, all come from the fact that I do this because God made me a minister. I don't do this for kicks. I don't do this for joys. I do this because God made me a minister and so that you may be mature and complete. That's why I suffer as I do. That's why I labor as I do. Because I do this because God's called me to do this. That's why I do this today. I'm here week after week because God has called me to this message. And as Paul says, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are so very grateful for your word. We thank you, Father, for um, those men and women that you have called and appointed to be ministers. We know that their lives are not easy. We know that they are doing this not because they want to, because, but rather because you have appointed them and you have entrusted them with this ministry. And so I pray that you would help us to be as supportive as we can to these men and women. May we listen when they have something to say. May we, may we be receptive when they are speaking to us. And Father, may we daily lift them up in our prayers to God for them. Father, we ask for your help in these things, and we pray these things, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.